mentioned because there are a couple people that I don't know yet. Hello, I'm Mel Hauser. Um, I use she, they pronouns, and I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong Vermont. And I am very excited that you've all joined us here today for Brain Club, where we're going to be talking about communicating your access needs at work. And this is building on um, our whole month uh, this this month uh, has been about access needs. And um, we, before I introduce our presenter tonight, um, I'll first go through some introductions and ground rules of how we do things here at Brain Club and um, uh, do a little bit of a recap um, on, on the conversations we've had thus far about access needs. So, um, all forms of participation are okay here. You can have, so it's, it's, uh, the folks participating um, uh, have already figured this out. You can have your video on or off. Um, and even if you do have your video on, we do not expect eye contact or any other kind of, uh, you know, any, 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 any behavior conforming to any kind of code of there being one right way to be a person because that's not a thing. And in fact, that's bad for health. Um, so you can do whatever needs doing, walk, move around, fidget, snack, take breaks. And as I, as I, as I was saying before, um, uh, everyone's welcome here, kids and pets and anything goes. And you can communicate um, however um, is most comfortable to you. You can unmute and speak. You can type in the chat box, gesture, whatever, whatever works for you. And um, safety is really important to us here. So in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, we really want to respect and protect one another's access needs, speaking of access needs. And so um, what that um, also uh, um, uh, results in is that you are welcome to share anything you're comfortable uh, talking about. But just keep in mind that if you are talking about something that you personally experienced as traumatic, we, it's just a good idea to let other people know about it first. So a, a content warning or a trigger warning, um, this way listeners can listen with informed consent versus choosing to do what they need to, to feel safe, whether that be, you know, leave the room for a few minutes or, um, or turn their sound off. And then uh, we'll always type in the chat box with content warning over. All right. Um, last grounds keeping, that's not even a word. Um, housekeeping um, uh, is captions. I'm going to turn on the, oh, they're already on. No, they're not already on. They are now on. Great. Um, so uh, um, if, if you'd like access to closed captioning and they're not happening automatically, or um, if they are happening automatically and you don't want them to, either click the live transcript CC icon or the more dot 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 and choose either show subtitles or hide subtitles. Okay, so access needs. What's an access need? Anything required to meaningfully participate in one's environment or community. Everyone has access needs. Everyone with all types of brains. And this can be physical, emotional, communication, technology, medical, like all types of access needs. We all have them. And um, when your access needs are not met um, in your environment, whether that be in healthcare, in education, in your employment setting, um, that's not good for health. That's not good for um, uh, being able to be your best self. Because um, what we don't want is we don't want um, a, a square peg in a round hole to have to like be chiseled away and changed um, to fit in this peg into the, so, so where that, where that uh, leaves us is that um, over, the, over the past month, we've been talking about, you know, how do you communicate your access needs um, in relationships, how do you communicate your access needs in healthcare settings? Um, and um, I am thrilled to welcome our, uh, our guest presenter today. Um, Cami Naylor is a staff attorney at Vermont Legal Aid with the Disability Law Project. And Cami's gonna be talking um, about the, um, the access needs at work situation and how to 
uh, support um, conversations about these topics. Thank Take you. it away, Cami. Thank you so much. So if you don't mind, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes level setting about what the like legal rights are that we're talking about so that when we do move into sort of the broader conversation of access rights, we have a reference point for like, when is this access need a right? And when is it like an, my access need? Does that, does that make sense? All right. So, um, you should be seeing a little PowerPoint. Everybody see the PowerPoint? Great. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about employment and, and accommodations, um, a brief overview. Where does the right to accommodations in your employment come from? Predominantly, it comes from the Americans with Disabilities Act. Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act covers employment. It requires that no covered entity, so there are some employers that are excluded, um, mostly employers who have um, fewer than 15 employees, um, shall discriminate against a qualified individual, we'll get to what a qualified individual means, on the basis of a disability in regard to job application procedures, the hiring, advan hiring advancement, or discharge of employees, employee compensation, job training, and other terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. And there is some of this also in the Vermont Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act, but a lot of <clears throat> when we're involved in this work, we're, we're using the ADA more. Um, okay, so what is disability? Everyone has their own definition for their needs. Um, for some folks, it's their identity and disability. For some folks, it's identity and not disability. Right now, we're just talking about like in the legal context, you know, if you how your needs show up and if you want to access the right to reasonable accommodation. So disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity of an individual a record of having such an impairment or being regarded as having an impairment. So for example, um, someone is a wheelchair user and that, that person needs some, has some physical, actual like building physical access needs to be able to, to enter a building. They're not going to be someone who, when the conversation of what, are, what are their, access needs, what accommodations do they need comes up. In general, if it's around physical accessibility, they're not really gonna be someone who's asked to then show additional medical evidence that they need that, right? Cause it's, it's very visible. For folks who have needs or disabilities that are invisible, um, they might be required to show some sort of medical documentation or present a, a doctor's letter in support. Um, so just keeping that in mind, what is a qualified individual? That's an individual who, with or without reasonable accommodation, can perform the essential functions of an employment position. So the essential functions of that position are determined by the employer. If you have a written job description, that's usually pretty good evidence of what those essential functions are. So an individual who's seeking accommodations in the workplace, right, the right, um, has to be able to do the job. Um, if they can do it with accommodations, great. But if there's like an aspect of the job that someone's really unable to do, that might not be a reasonable accommodation. So reasonable accommodations can include making existing facilities used by employees readily accessible. Um, they can, it can also include job restructuring, part-time or modified work schedules, reassignment to a vacant position. That's what a lot of folks sometimes refer to as like a right to transfer. Acquisition, so in that particular case, that'd be for somebody who they've asked for an accommodation and the employer says, that's a, that's a fundamental alteration. You're no longer performing the essential functions of the job. 
that's that's when some that might trigger someone the right to transfer. For example, if someone is diabetic and they were hired to work at the front desk in an emergency room, they one of the job requirements might be that they need to be present at the desk at all times, except for specifically assigned breaks. If somebody is severely diabetic, they might need more flexibility in their day to be able to respond to their medical needs, what their blood sugar is doing. But that person not being available at the desk is a fundamental alteration of the essential functions of that particular hospital job. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're not otherwise qualified for another sort of front desk job in the hospital environment. Does that make sense? So again, that's where the right to transfer might come in. <clears throat> Acquisition or modifications of equipment and devices, so assistive technology, things that can help, appropriate adjustments or modifications or examinations um, in the context of a job that you might have to test into. Um, training materials or policies, say someone needs, um, in order to really be able to best learn, someone needs to have information presented to them in writing before it's then reviewed with them and then they're given a practice opportunity. Um, that, that's what that would could potentially look like. Um, provisions of qualified readers or interpreters, folks who have, who are deaf, hard of hearing, and have some type of communication barrier are also entitled to effective communication. Um, and so, you know, what that means can depend person to person, but for a really small company, if someone needs a full-time interpreter, we might be talking about a situation that is, um, is too costly for that organization. Um, and other, other accommodations. So really an accommodation can be almost anything you need in order to better access your job so long as it is not a fundamental alteration or an undue burden. So fundamental alteration again means something about what you're asking for changes that, that position, that job. Undue burden means it's too much money, right? The nature and cost of the accommodation needed, or it's too much to manage, um, you know, and, and that takes into account the overall financial resources of an employer and the type of organization that it is. And then I have a little flow chart here um, just, to, just to sort of try to sum up what the reasonable accommodation process is in, in terms of Title II. Um, so a person in order to qualify for an accommodation under Title II, they need to be asking for it. Um, if, if an employer sees that someone might need an accommodation, they, they should be considering and working with that person, but the law requires first the request. And then the person makes a request. Maybe they don't totally know or they know exactly what they need, but their employer is saying, I don't know that we can manage that particular request. That triggers what we call an interactive dialogue. You're supposed to be able to have a conversation with the employer about what your needs are and what their needs are and really try to meet in the middle. And then either the accommodations put into place or the employer says, this is really more than we can manage in these circumstances um, for, for one of those two legal reasons, right? Fundamental alteration, undue burden, not doing the essential functions of the job. So that is, I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, that's just a little quick review of what the context of the law that we're talking about is. I am going to put, I lost my chat function. I'm going to put in the chat because I made that into a handout for y'all. So I'm just going to put that into the chat. And then um, Dr. Hauser and I have some questions and I think we're going to do a little bit of a Q&A, but um, not but. And those questions are in this handout for folks. So when you see the handout, you should, 
fingers crossed, hopefully, if I didn't mess something up, be able to um, make make notes. Sorry, I should have practiced putting things hey. in the chat. I really should have practiced putting things in the chat. Oh, it's totally, it's totally fine. I think if you, um, if you have the, if, if you want to, if, if it's not working for whatever reason, if you email it to me, I can put it in the chat. Okay. Um, hang on. I think yeah, I got take it. Time. Sorry. No worries. I thought I was all prepared. It did take me six full minutes to share my screen a few minutes ago. Okay. There we go. Um, it is sending. It's just a PDF, so hope sh hopefully I should be able to um, edit it in any way they need or print it off. Um, cool. It looks like it works. That's amazing. Great. Yeah. Okay. So you have all the legal information that I just reviewed. And then, like I said, you'll have slides with the questions that Dr. Nhauser and I are going to talk about, um, just so some guideposts in case you're keeping a record of this information for yourself. Um, Amazing. So one of the things that comes up a lot um, for my patients is just like, what, what's your opinion on the advantages and disadvantages <laughs> of disclosing a disability at work? Yeah. So I, I just want to say uh, as a little bit more preface, some of these conversations are, or some of these questions are legal questions. And some of these are really impression, um, you know, what, what's the best practice type question. I just want to acknowledge that this is one of those questions that could go either way. <laughs> um, so with that said, um, you know, it's, it's hard. It, and it, in some cases, it's going to come down to an individual decision. So there is a right to reasonable accommodations in employment. And that right requires a person to first show, and in some cases prove, they have a disability. Um, meaning not every person is entitled to accommodations in the workplace. So as much as I'd like to see that everyone has their access needs met in the workplace, um, it's, it's not an entitlement for everyone. And so, you know, some people have great, super supportive employers who are just working with them and they like know them as a human and they're like, oh yeah, like we, we do this for, for example, I need a lot of exercise. Um, my boss is super supportive of me working that into my day, so long as it's not interfering with my workload. Um, that's, that's an access need of mine, but I'm not being reasonably accommodated in that way. I don't have a right to, you know, time in my day to, to get exercise in. Um, so that's just, you know, an example of that distinction. So if you're someone and you'll need an accommodation to carry out the essential functions of your job, then you might be someone who wants to consider entering into or requesting a reasonable accommodation. So for example, <clears throat> let's go back to the to the example I gave about training. You're hired for a job and you know that you need training in a particular way. You need all of the information in written instruction first, then you need that reviewed with you, and then you need a practice opportunity. If you don't request this training style as an accommodation that meets your learning needs, i.e. making your learning needs known, the company is gonna train you however they do trainings. And if then you're not able to do the work you were trained for, you could face firing. So in this instance, someone could at the outset make a reasonable accommodation request to say, this is how I need information presented to me so that I can learn and so that I can perform my job. Someone might also say they've, they've gone through the training. They knew maybe it wasn't the best fit for them, but they were really really hoping this time I didn't need to pre-teach, right? That person could make an, a reasonable accommodation request in that context, um, you know, either for retraining or sort of like for a second chance, you know, like I need this training again. I, I thought I would be able to access it. But one of the challenges then becomes if an employer has a discriminatory and a non-discriminatory reason for firing someone, 
they get to fire that person. Um, so that's, and not that they get to fire that person, but if they fight, so sorry, I should have said that differently. If an employer has a discriminatory and a non-discriminatory reason for considering firing someone and they fire them, that firing is seen as non-discriminatory because they had a legitimate reason to fire them. So again, that person who has some specific learning needs and needs information presented to them in a particular way is entering into a new role where they're going to need to be trained to do that. That person is probably going to want to consider disclosing their disability, requesting reasonable accommodations to set them up for success in that job. Um, and then really, I think that the question of advantages and disadvantages of disclosing your disability at work, that's so personal. You know, if you're somebody who doesn't have a need for reasonable accommodations, is it important to you that, that your colleagues or your supervisor know who you are or, you know, what you might be showing up with. Um, and so I think it comes down to the question of, do I need reasonable accommodations in order to do this job, to perform the essential functions of this job? And if I don't, what, what, what is this environment and what's going to be the safest for me personally? Do, do I need people to know who I am or this part of who I am or do I, is it not something I want to talk about? Um, any follow-up questions to that one? Well, one of the things that, um, that we talk about uh, a lot about sometimes is, is there a middle ground? Can you potentially get your access needs met without going down the legal entitlement track? Mm -hmm. Like maybe you... Um, maybe, uh, I, 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 I may not want to disclose that I'm autistic because there's something about the culture where I am that mm -hmm. makes me not want to do that for whatever reason doesn't feel safe to me. Um, but I might be like really bothered by the fluorescent lights and mm -hmm. as an accommodation, I might want to wear my sunglasses when I'm in my office. So I might say like, oh, I have the kind of brain that's like really bothered by the lights. Is it okay if I wear my sunglasses? And I just make it like not a big deal. And I maybe get my access needs met. That access Yeah. Needs yeah. Um, I mean, I think that you're right that there, there is a middle ground. I mean, you know, especially depending on where you are and what you're doing. But I think it's individual to every person and every job. Um Perhaps you work in some sort of packing or distribution center. Turning the lights off is going to be a safety concern. Um, or you're like me and you just work in an office and never even turning the lights on. Nobody cares that I'm sitting in the dark. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there's there's always potential middle ground. I think I gave I gave the example earlier of, um, you know, my job inherently, there there is a requirement for what I have to do, and there's also some flexibility around how I get that done as far as time. So I have a I have a basic requirement for the number of hours that I have to fulfill and the amount of work that I have to do in a pay period, and I have to I have to be managing my cases. I have to be doing my workload, um, <clears throat> and there are some requirements for like when I need to be in the office, but to a certain extent. You know, I, I get to, I am able to, I get to, I have the privilege of doing my work on when it suits me, right? When work for my schedule. And so, you know, I think that that is a frequently a privilege that comes with someone who has a more professional, professional type job. Um, every job can be a profession. Um but somebody who works in what we would more traditionally consider like a professional type circumstance. Um, and so, you know, there's that privilege piece of it too. Totally. And um, even if someone works in an office setting, they may not be salaried. Mm -hmm. And so being salaried um, potentially like, like affords some privilege and flexibility um, when many people um, in the ADV village, it's time. Time mm -hmm. is 
the access need. Yeah. And so how does that play out for someone who is an hourly employee who needs more time to do the thing and can do the mm-hmm. thing um, with more time? How, how do, what are some ways that that might play out? Um, well, you know, I think that that gets into a little bit more employment law than I'm particular with. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that. So to my knowledge, most hourly employees who are employed on an hourly basis um, are or what we call non-exempt employees, which which means that if they exceed 40 hours of work, um, then they then they can get paid overtime. They have to get paid overtime. So if we have someone who has some time related needs and can still perform all the essential functions of that job within the 40 hours that they have available to them, then I think that that's generally something that could be accommodated, right? But if it's somebody who can't get all of the tasks related to the job done, then we're entering into the essential functions, fundamental alteration territory. Now, if somebody needs an extra 10 minute, 10 hours to, to do whatever the job is, you know, that's probably going to be more of a fundamental alteration than somebody who needs an additional hour or half hour or 40 minutes in a, in a time period or in a, in a single week. And so I think that that's just really dependent on the individual circumstances, you know, with every employment situation, you know, the context that we're talking in, it's really such an individual and case-by-case analysis. Um, but I think, I think in that particular circumstance, you know, again, depending on the culture, depending on what you're doing and who you're working with, like having, having a conversation, you know, for somebody who's an hourly employee, maybe, um, you know, instead of a full half hour lunch break, they prefer to take 10 minute breaks every two hours or something like that. Like that, that's pretty, that's pretty reasonable. That's an easy cover. I, I would hope that that would be an easy conversation to have. Um, maybe not every employer is able to do that because you're the only person present and available until your lunch break. Um, so again, I think it's, it's so case by case and you're right. There is a lot of privilege associated with being a salaried employee, um, which I think is, you know, this is one of the places where the law and accessing that right to a reasonable accommodation and, and having that interactive dialogue can, in fact, be really supportive for someone, um, you know, then, then you have, even, even if that particular employer happens to not be supportive, then at least you have a means to say, I requested a reasonable accommodation. Not only did you deny my reasonable accommodation, but then you fired me or you acted out against me because of what I requested. And there's, there's some teeth, um, so to say. That's super helpful. And by the way, um, if anyone has um, questions, feel free to um, now, now I'm not in sure screen mode, so I can, I can actually see you if you raise your hand or feel free to type in the chat. Um, and, and as, as you're thinking of your questions, Cami, I'm going to combine my next okay. couple of questions that we did right. talk about ahead of time. So do you have thoughts on when the best time, if you're, if you've decided to go ahead and disclose a disability, mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on like, when is the, when, when is the time to do it? Should you do it like at the application process? Should you do it during the interview? Should you mm-hmm. do it beside you before you, during your onboarding? Or like, yeah. how does that play out? That comes up a lot in, in, in our healthcare practice. I bet it's such a, tr- a tricky question. So this is one of those questions that is likely not a legal question. Um, and so my answer like any good lawyer is going to be, it depends. Um, And it depends on every person's like individual needs, right? And I talked about this a little bit. And the last question, is your disability an aspect of your identity? And you just can't, you can't serve, or are your access needs, or, you know, if you're autistic, 
do you, do you, is that a part of your identity? Do you need people to know I'm autistic? Um, you just can't survive in a workplace where people don't understand that. You, you might want to disclose that that might actually be a part of your interview process or on your application. You know, this is, this is a part of who I am. Um, now in the legal context, to the best of someone's ability, if they have concerns that without reasonable accommodations, they cannot perform the fundamental or the essential functions of their job, that person should request, should consider requesting reasonable accommodations, disclosing their disability before they have a problem, right? Because what I said earlier is true. When an employer has a discriminatory and a non-discriminatory reason to fire someone, that firing is seen as non-discriminatory. So a person needs to be thinking about what is this job? What are my access needs? Are there aspects of what's being asked of me in this job that without accommodation or support, I can't do, or I can't do in the way that they're asking me to? And if the answer to that question is yes, then that person might be someone who is in need of some reasonable accommodations. Um, you know, and, and again, I think one thing that's important is that reasonable accommodations, they don't, they don't have to be something that exists for the rest of your working career. So I'm going to use myself as an example again. After I had my son, I had really bad postpartum anxiety. To tell you the truth, I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> what I knew was working 45 minutes from where my son was in daycare was physically painful. And I was not managing it well. Every moment I wasn't buried in my work, I was worried about what he was doing and how long it would take me to get back to him if something went wrong. I said to my boss, I'm distracted. I'm struggling. I'm doing my work fine. I'm keeping up on my work fine, but I'm not, I'm not really well in the process. Can I do X so that two days a week, right? I think I ask, you know, can I, can I work somewhere different two or three days a week so that it minimizes that stress? Um, you know, and, and we worked that situation out. The pandemic happened like two weeks later. So there wasn't a whole lot that needed to be done because then I was with him all the time. But like that in that conversation, I didn't disclose that I had postpartum anxiety. Frankly, I didn't even understand that I had postpartum anxiety at the time. What I did understand was that something was going on that made me physically uncomfortable, physically and emotionally just uncomfortable unable to show up to the best of my abilities. I was still showing up, but I didn't have a diagnosis. And even just that conversation triggered the reasonable accommodation process. Now I work for legal aid, right? So we arguably, we know a little bit more about what we're doing, but that is to say that someone doesn't necessarily need to disclose all of their disability to say, I'm experiencing something a physical or mental condition that's impacting my ability to perform the essential functions of my job. Here's what's going on. I need support. Um, so, you know, disclose when it's right for you, unless you think that you do need to access those Title II of the ADA rights to reasonable accommodation. And remember that in requesting a reasonable accommodation, even if, if full disclosure of what your needs are is too much, you can try first to say, here's what's going on and here's something I think might help. Your employer can say, I need some evidence. And that's when you might think about getting a doctor's note. Um, but you have, there is that little bit of ability for ambiguity too. Yeah, and I think that a lot of times people don't necessarily have ideas for what would help. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, they, they, they might ask their doctor and sometimes their doctor knows, um, Mm -hmm. like this is, this, this is what we do all day, but that's, that's not everyone's focus of their practice. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, um, are there any, and this again is not necessarily a legal question, but just like in, in the, the course of supporting folks with disabilities, Mm -hmm. um, like, do you have thoughts about like, first off, how do you have those conversations? Like maybe some scripts or some, some language to use in those conversations and like how to even begin the process of thinking what to ask for. So legally there's no magic words and we frequently find that it is very important for someone to say, this is what's going on and I need a reasonable accommodation. Um, and that is to say, like, again, the law requires no magic words, but it's very helpful to use magic words from time to time. Um, and I actually have a colleague who has a really great script and I'm not that person, (laughs) but so it is, it is, you know, it depends on sort of who you're working with or what's going on, but it is, this is my disability. I need reasonable accommodations this is what I'm struggling with. I am in, you know, in in this case, I'm assuming someone's working with like a physician or voc rehab, I, or higher ability, excuse me. I'm working with higher ability. They're helping me figure out what accommodations I need to, to be successful with these problems that I'm having. I haven't quite put those pieces together, but higher ability is helping me for that. So I need a reasonable accommodation of a little bit more time and a heads up of what might not be going right so that I can go back to higher ability and they can help me so that I can come and continue to be successful. And often, you know, I, I will say there have been, I've, I've had a couple cases for young men or young people on the autism spectrum who are either post high school or post college entering their first job. Um, and they're connected with higher ability and they still really struggle. Um, and, and a lot of them, the handful that I've, of the cases that I've had, they, they end up being fired from their first job, um, because they have said like, I need help but I don't know what, or, um, you know, I, well, this was really helpful to me in the past, but they haven't said, I need a reasonable accommodation for my disability. I'm working with this organization. They're trying to help me figure that out. I'm working really hard. I need a little, I need more time. And then whatever accommodation we figure out, I'm, I'm, I'm going to need that too but they're going to help me with like, with asking for that, or they might even help me with setting that up. Right. So if someone's hooked up with voc rehab or connected with higher ability, they might have some funding to support whatever accommodation that that person needs to do. So, um, you know, there, there are outside organizations that can really help in this process. And, um, what I can do, my, my colleague is on a very well-deserved vacation right now. Um, but when she gets back, I will, I'll check in with her and I'll get her to write down what her script is. Um, because it's, it's, I think my example is good, but it's far better. I promise than the example that I just gave. And I'll send that to you. Okay. So that so, yeah, we'll collect can, like, have all that as a resource. Scripts we can, right? Because <laughs> like so many people are having having these conversations and really struggling and 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 uh, not being not receiving um, the responses yeah. necessarily that that they're looking for. And that's so demoralizing. It's so so hard if you are in a circumstance and you're saying, I, you know, this really worked for me in the past, and then that employer maybe isn't the most thoughtful or sensitive person or, you know, is very good at personing and they like, they, they like laugh and they're like, well, if you need a support person, why wouldn't I just hire that person to do the job? Like that, that happens to people. Um, So I, and by the way, um, for anyone um, who has 
a question. So, so we've got about um, a li li little bit over 15 minutes to go. So if anybody has questions, please raise your hand or type them in the chat. Otherwise, I can keep asking questions all day. Um, but but uh, but I, I think you and I have no <laughs> no lack of anything, anything to talk about. Just, but. Uh, yeah, like I don't have time yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, I I worked. I'll oh, go ahead, Laura. Go ahead. I just, Cami, this has been really, really helpful. I'm sorry, there's a lot of noise in the background here, but um, I teach nursing students and a lot of our nursing students have accommodations during their education. And I'm just thinking like so, a lot of this information would be so helpful to have students here as they're trying to enter the workforce and trying to figure out like what that looks like, especially in a clinical setting where I think a lot of employers don't really think outside of the box about what are essential components of the job and what can be reasonably accommodated. And I, I kind of just want to connect with you and see if it's something we could even run as a session for our nursing students who have this on their mind and they're trying to think about what their next steps might be. Yeah. I feel like this is just really helpful. I'll, um, I'll pop my email address in the chat. Um, definitely reach out to me. I, I really like, it's one of the great joys of my job in addition to just helping incredible people, but um, I really like doing trainings and talking to people. It, it's a part of my job I really like. <laughs> well, I have more questions for okay. you, but then you'll love it. Um, so, uh, um, so can't go into detail. This is a process not related to my current job. It appears that I'm currently being ghosted after asking for reasonable accommodations for a process well known for accommodations. I've worked hard for this thing and being ghosted feels like it could be a level of discrimination or barring me from something moving my life forward in a major way versus others going after this. Um, I'm not a legal retaliation type of person, but can I do anything? Um, it seems like this is a particular type of situation. Um, you know, I think what I would encourage you to do if, is if you think that you've been discriminated against because of a disability for a disability re related reason, for asking for the accommodation um, and sort of this is your circumstance, I would encourage you to contact our, um, our helpline, um, complete an intake. We're taking about 14 days to get back to people right now, but once, once we get you through intake, um, you will likely be connected with an attorney and you can have that confidential conversation about what's been going on to explore your individual um, opportunities. Um, in general, if someone is concerned that they've been discriminated against in some sort of um, government or educational type, we're talking like post high school, post sort of like mandatory ed, um, process, um, I would tend to consider that something that if the person was interested in, in complaining about that, and by complaining about that, I mean, you know, filing something, having someone else look into it, that's usually something I would send to the Human Rights Commission, the Vermont Human Rights Commission. Um, if somebody has had an employment matter that they believe that they were discriminated against, um, that's really a little bit more tricky and kind of nuanced in the sense that it comes down in some cases to whether you want the job back or not, or if you're still in the job, how much work you want to do to preserve that job itself. Um, so, so in that circumstance, the, um, the civil rights office for the Vermont attorney generals has a complaint process, a, 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 an employment complaint process. Their investigations do take some time, but that is um, the really great investigatory entity that we've frequently are sending people with concerns of employment discrimination too. And then again, like I said, so concerns of discrimination in places of public accommodation or, um, you know, so anything like really under like Title II or Title III of the ADA. So places of public accommodation or like local vendors, um, local businesses, um, that would be something I would encourage somebody to look into the HRC. Um, but if 
but if you have some particular questions and want to to like share a little bit more about what your story is to get more personalized recommendations or some technical assistance perhaps um i would encourage you to contact our helpline or to contact the hrc directly and have that conversation with them that call would also be confidential i appreciate that thank you i, I can't Definitely. really too much detail it but... sounds like whatever you're going through is um really hard and really painful and, oh, and leaving so you kind of in a stalled place um and i'm really i'm really sorry for that yeah it just seems like it's for me like uh, a simple ask like i can't do this thing this is why you know what i mean using all this assertive language it seems clear and uh what was i gonna say it just uh, it, it for some people it's like you know you can get through to them pretty easily um but from others, it, it's surprising when it's like to a level where it's like, this is mind blowing, this simple thing that I cannot do that takes 10 minutes. I get ghosted and a week goes by and I've, you know, really, really, really hard throughout this process that I'm doing. And, you know, other people are, may not be neurodivergent that are going up against me. And I feel like I've worked the hardest for this thing. And that, you know, I mean, I get it if they're just literally ghosting me. I put the word, I have an accommodations letter from a doctor. I said, if, I, if necessary, I explained um, very professionally and concisely, but it's just surprising. It's just surprising that it, this, like an access need isn't just like, that seems so simple. That's not a big deal. It's just, you know, you never know when you get reach a person where it's like the level, this is like blows their world away or something. And it seems so simple to you, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's so, that's, that's so unfair. I'm so sorry. I think that 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 is one of sort of the ongoing challenges, right, is um, in order to have a person's needs met and protected under the law, that person has to be prepared to, like, disclose all of those needs and and a lot of their medical information, Um, you know we would all like to live in a society where people's needs are just met. Um, We're not there yet. I'm so sorry. Um, If you, if you, you know, the HRC might be a good place for you depending on, on what it is. And if you want to go through our intake process and potentially talk to one of us, that's, that's available to you as well. I hope it doesn't come down to that. I mean, at at this point, I mean, honestly, this thing, I will, in 14 days, I would definitely lose it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Long, but we do we do do some triage and so if it is a time sensitive thing you know there there is a way to to flag that um dr hauser also has not that she needs more work but she has our community partners portal information which can sometimes expedite referrals if you if that's available to you but um you know i don't know what the wait time is for the hrc but they're they're also yeah. very very good yeah, I appreciate that your process that you have, and it's extremely good advice. And I think it's yeah. a very good process. So, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Anyone else have any questions? Feel free to unmute. Feel free to type in the chat box. Otherwise, as I, as I said, I have so many questions, but I'm gonna pause and, and give you all space. And, and because I don't feel time, I always try to, I, I try to wait longer than I think I've waited, even though I, th- I feel like I've waited, like, you know, you know I, I know it hasn't been five minutes, but it, it probably has not even been one minute. So anyway, <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, you mentioned, Cami, when you, when you, when you said public accommodations, that, mm-hmm. that just made, that, that, that's, uh, this isn't exactly what you were talking about, but, but uh, most of you who've, who, who know me or have been to other brain clubs know that I can't actually finish a conversation without talking about COVID. Um, so, so, so how does, how does that play out? Like people who they're, um, the, the reasonable accommodation Mm-hmm. that they may be requesting at their workplace um, is like relates to the COVID and their risk of, of getting COVID and not wanting to get COVID, um, particularly because the neurodivergent community is at higher risk of complications from COVID. So much like these conversations are being had 
um, you know, by families uh, about their, their kids and students accessing school. How's this plan at work? I have not seen this come up actually. Um, I, I haven't, I haven't had any cases on this topic since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so I'll just say that. And, and in the cases that I, those particular cases that I had, um, they were not favorable to the individual who was seeking my advice. Um, those cases, the handful that I did have came down to needing accommodations to not mask. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, at that time, right. Um, depending on what your needs are in your work environment, you may be entitled to reasonable accommodations. Um, I don't, you know, those could look like just like what they look like for kiddos at school. Um, so masking, masking in common places. Um, you know, I think Mel, we were just at that talk last week where, um, well, was he an aerosol mechanic? He was mechanic? A flu- uh, like a, like a, yeah, like a fluid mechanic scientist. So, cool. so a gentleman who is a professor at, I think, EVM, um, specializes in aerosols and what he shared with this group of people who we were talking to about protecting kids in schools is that in addition to a well-fitting mask, what's actually in his mind, in his opinion, and the information that he shared, potentially more effective is air filtration. Um, You know, and so I don't know, you know, if somebody's in a cubicle or an office and they want to bring in their own air purifier, that's not even something that you have to ask for. Um, you know, I think it, it does become more complicated for someone who's, say, a teacher. Um, but we've not had those calls yet. And um, so I don't know, but I would, incremit- I would encourage that person to engage in the reasonable accommodation process with, um, with their administration. Um, that that is what's available in these circumstances and again i think in these covid related cases um dr hauser has heard me say this so many times it's probably painful at this point but the quality of your medical evidence <laughs> is one of the most important factors in determining the outcome of your accommodation request um and that is is that it is the request is directly linked to the current medical science, whatever the request is, is really tailored, really specific, frankly, as individualized as possible. Um, And, you know, has some sort of built-in review period. But then, you know, everyone should be following the CDC's recommendations as well, which I know are not Dr. Hauser can tell us more about those. I think I think that we're going to have to have like uh, we we've, we've never had like a dedicated um, uh, COVID or you know I think even just like a long COVID really brain club I think that'd be useful and good anyway. Um, we probably have time for one more question if anybody has any more questions. Yes, long COVID brain club. All right some other human wants me to do it it's all I want to talk about all day so we'll do it Becky hi this is Christina speaking hey, of good for it. COVID, I'm actually I'm actually dealing with that right now but um yeah this is crazy my first time but um and I work from home but um my question was more as I like reviewed your slides and your content and stuff like that, Um, Cami. it sounds like if you aren't going into a job at the onset of like knowing that you need reasonable accommodations, discovering it in the interim, um, if you have kind of like a a workplace that might not be super flexible or, it doesn't sound like you have a whole lot of protections. <laughs> um, 
I don't know. It, it just seems like the language is pretty vague and there's a lot of loopholes there for companies to kind of skirt out of this. Um, it just kind of doesn't give me a whole lot of confidence in um, disclosing anything. Um, just to be honest, I don't know. Um, does this usually fall to the benefit of the employer when an employee kind of um, pursues this route of getting accommodations? <laughs> hmm. Okay. So you you asked the question: Does it fall to the benefit of the employer when an account when an employee um, and they don't have a prior like record of um, like they just discovered this is not working for me? Um, yeah. So so I under I understand that, but there was something about what I was hearing initially. And, and so, um, but I can't form sort of what the question I was hearing was, and I apologize. It's late. Um, so, you know, most employment, most places of employment have some sort of review process. Um, there is in in most employment type situations there's there's some sort of feedback process um now if if you're struggling in a job you're a person with a disability and you've never gotten feedback that you're not doing well you you don't know right you don't know and so the pro it, it can be employer favorable and it depends. Every single case depends on the individual facts and circumstances. And I just want to say, like you said, that the law that I have presented in this presentation looks very vague and has a lot of loopholes. I was trying to present the most like boiled down vocabulary really to just provide like a primer so that we just had a sort of a shared understanding of some of what the law is and some of what the process is. So you should know that a lot of the language I used comes from Title II of the ADA, the act itself. There are also regulations implementing Title II of the ADA. They are, or Title I and Title II and Title III of the ADA, right? They are far more broad. So I don't, I don't want to say, I'm not comfortable saying that it's employer focused or employer favorable because like I said, every case depends on the individual facts and circumstances. However, if somebody's in a job, they've received negative performance reviews, they're trying to do better. They're sort of working on the outsides to do better. Um, but based on based on the feedback in that performance review, um, but they're not requesting accommodations or they're not having that conversation with their employer, I see that I am having trouble in this these areas. I have a disability. I believe my disability is impacting my performance in these areas. I'm trying to figure out what's gonna help me be able to to meet this demand, right? Because it's a, it's essentially a demand. Um, if you don't have that conversation, you have no protections. If you do have that conversation, if you are trying in that process, then there, then then you have some protections. Now, if it goes on and on, and you're not making improvements based on a performance evaluation. They're saying I need reasonable accommodations, but I don't know what they are. You're not having an interactive dialogue with your employer and you're not improving, not coming up with anything. That's a very different case than say, you have that conversation with your employer. You say, oh my gosh, I'm like, horrified by this performance evaluation. I'm actually really crestfallen by those. I thought I was doing really well. I see these areas where you've identified that I'm struggling. Um, I actually think that these are disability related. I am, you know, I'm, I'm working with a physician. I'm working with a therapist. 
I'm going to come to you next week with some ideas for what types of reasonable accommodations might allow me to perform better in these areas. And I, and I hope that we can have that conversation. That person who comes back and says, okay, like I'm ready to have the conversation. I still don't have any ideas, but like my doctor said this, and that can trigger the interactive dialogue and you and your employer can brainstorm and they can say, you know, based on what you're telling us, we did this with another employee. Let's try that. Um, that person's going to have a lot more protections. So there is an aspect of disclose to protect yourself if that's necessary. Um, but then, it, you know, there are going to be some employers where you don't get performance evaluations. They're like, We've had you for four months. You're not up to the job. We're firing you. Um, someone may or may not know. So in that particular situation, there's there's probably not going to be a whole lot that that person can do. So it can go a number of different ways. And I would like to remind you that the law that I presented in this presentation is intentionally vague just to kind of ground us in some vocabulary. Um But that the better that you're communicating with your employer, depending on how supportive of an employer you have, um, the stronger the legal analysis in your in your case goes. Um, so even if you have a super unsupportive employer, day one, you say in the interview process, I have a disability. So they they already know. They don't, you don't have any conversation about accommodations. I have a disability. They hire you. You say, I need some free teaching and training and I need a little extra help. They don't give that to you. Um, at this point, you still, they know that you have a disability. You still haven't said I need reasonable accommodations. Then you have some trouble and you say, I need, I'm working with my physician, my therapist, um, you know, my vocational counselor, higher ability. Um, could, could you, can we set up a meeting with them? They don't do anything. That's somebody who, who may have a pretty strong case um, or maybe not a discriminatory firing, but but perhaps disparate treatment in the work environment. Like there's, so not reasonably accommodating somebody is not the only way to discriminate against somebody in the workplace also. Um, it's, it's hard to say, right? We're talking in ambiguities and imagined, not imagined, but um, not the most tangible circumstances. It's, it's case by case. And it's a fact-based analysis. Right. And um, a lot of topics we discuss in Brain Club all come down to communication and the safety that someone feels in their environment, interpersonally, like interpersonal safety. And when we think about the, you know, the double empathy problem, where it's not like there's a, you know, a correct way of communicating and then like a, an abnormal way of communicating, it's that when people have a mismatch of worldviews and communication styles, there is conflict and there's a lot of misunderstandings. And what I see in my practice is that um, people who have conflicting access needs with their employer already, um, there's already that, la that, that, that loss of safety. And then it becomes this very antagonistic and like legalistic thing that goes on um, where that situation was never gonna work out. Um, it, it was, it, it, and it's, and it's, it's sad and it's, but it, it's, 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 it's not going to work out even if everyone gets the particular thing that, that oh yeah, well, I'll grant you those, but, but you know, it's, it's not, um, like, uh, um, 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 the, the, the only time that I have had this personal experience was in, um, um, uh, requesting, I didn't even use 
um, the you know the reasonable accommodations language, um, and but but it was that was essentially the conversation. But again, I I didn't use the magic words maybe, but the particular response already gave me the clue that this was not going to work out. And so I was I did I I I didn't spend my spoons. I I I I plotted my exit plan. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's so, that's, it's so, this is not legal advice. It's just a human being or me talking. Um, but you know, it's, it's so important to the best of a person's ability to, to try to be working, to finding that work environment. That's a good fit for them. Um, that is a huge piece of it. Just, uh, for for everyone at a basic level like can I work here can I work with these people can I be myself or can I be whomever my professional self is um you know am I safe can I can I walk into the building and feel self-assured um like that I think that that's that's also a very privileged position to take or series of things to consider in terms of like I need a job um I need employment I need income um you know and and that's also just not a luxury that that everyone has and there are lots of people who are tolerating workplaces that that feel really toxic to them or feel really uncomfortable to them out of sheer necessity um, to pay rent and put food on the table. Um, so I think just like acknowledging that privilege piece of it's really important. Um, but if you have the ability to be shopping for, um, you know, an employment environment that's meets your needs or is suitable to you for who you are as a person or what your access needs are, yeah, do that. Um, you know, when you go in for an interview, like you're interviewing that employer just as much as they're interviewing you. Um, yes, 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 yes. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Cami, for your time and sharing your expertise with us. This was, this was really, really wonderful. And when I send yeah. out the recording, I'll also send out um uh those those slides but if um but but if if anyone hasn't had a chance to grab them out of the out of the chat thank you so much everyone thank and you all thank you mel for for having me um it's always it's so great to see you always it's so great to see you and and next week everyone we've got a, 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 a i think a really important another really important brain club um talking about bullying and 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 though some of our uh, community panelists are going to be talking about bullying within the school system and doing some community problem solving around that, I mean this 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 really will apply to to all domains of life when people are not being treated um, in a way that allows them to feel safe. And and when we think about equity and inclusion, who gets to show up? Who gets to feel like they belong? Like this this safety safety is a prerequisite for both of those things so no, no, just, yeah. just so you know we do representation for youth who are bullying hazed or harassed based on disability i did not know that that is yeah, that's, good information it's a, a part of part of um part of what we do so if you have any clients um or patients who I are have in need so of some legal, some legal advice, um, you know, feel free to refer those over if you think it's appropriate and if they want that. Thank you. Yeah. All, All right. right. Bye, everybody.